and hope you enjoy this webinar. We have a great lineup of speakers today. My name is Alex Mays, and I'm the Senior Policy Analyst at Healthy Schools Campaign, which is the organization that is hosting this webinar. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit more about Healthy Schools Campaign in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to walk through some of the logistics for today's webinar. Um, we encourage you to be a part of the conversation. Um, if you're participating in this webinar, feel free to tweet, um, hashtag green clean to share your thoughts, and you can follow us at Healthy Schools. Today's, oh, and today's webinar is part of a summer series of green cleaning webinars that we're excited to be hosting. All of these webinars will be featuring winners of our 2013 Green Cleaning Award. Um, so the dates and topics are posted. Following this webinar, we'll be sending out an email um, with a link to a recording of today's webinars and slides, in addition to links to register for these webinars. Um, so again, this webinar will run for approximately an hour, um, and we will be posting a recording online. You please take a minute to complete a survey at the end of the webinar just to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. We will be holding a question and answer session at the end of the webinar where we're going to be saving about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A session. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to type in questions. Um, into the question box. On, it should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Send them in throughout the webinar. We'll be sure to compile all those questions and ask some of our speakers at the end of the webinar. So we have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. We have Mark Bishop, uh, VP of Policy and Communications for Healthy Schools Campaign, Keith Webb, Executive Director of Plant Services at Newport News Public School and winner of the Grand Award for a K-12 category for the Green Cleaning Award and Jody Krause, the Assistant Director of Housekeeping for University of Wisconsin-Madison's Division of Housing. Um, and she, her program won the Silver Award for the Green, 2013 Green Cleaning Award. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Mark Bishop, um, who will be introing today's webinar. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so first of all, so, so for, thank you all for joining us. For those of you who are new to Healthy Schools Campaign, we are a not-for-profit organization. We're located in Chicago and work on, um, we work on the intersection of health um, and environment in schools. Um, our green cleaning work we've been working on since 2006, and we work on both state and, uh, state and federal policy to support implementation of green cleaning programs as well as working with developing tools to help schools implement green cleaning programs and identify best practices to create healthier, um, healthier learning environments for all kids. Um, our, quick, our, our green cleaning program started back in 2006 when we published our quick and easy guide to green cleaning in schools. It is a resource that is available free to schools. You can order hard copies of it or you can access it online at greencleanschools.org. We use this as our platform to talk about education and engagement with school stakeholders. We also have, an, have a number of, uh, of, of additional communications that, around all of our work for green cleaning, and our webinar series is just one of those pieces. So we're glad that you were able to join us and be part of this conversation. Um, we also want to recognize that now it's not just about the Healthy Schools campaign, but we partner with national organizations to help us get this word out, whether they be teacher unions, school administrators, uh, facility associations, we believe that green cleaning has an important, uh, is important to engage various stakeholders throughout the national and local communities, and we believe the work that we're doing and the guide that we put out represents that type of collaboration. So, as we get started, just to have us all in the same framework, where I like to ask the question of what is green cleaning? And from our perspective, Green cleaning is cleaning to protect health without harming the environment. And when we say that, we are very deliberative with the order of how we say that, because cleaning is always about protecting health. The reason why we clean our schools is the same reason why we clean our hospitals. We want to make sure we're not spreading diseases. We want to make sure that our kids are healthy, our teachers are safe, and that we have a learning environment where teachers and kids can thrive. Um, we don't clean so we can have shiny floors. We clean so we can breathe healthy air. Um, the other thing is, this, after we say protect health, we say, uh, so, so green cleaning is not just about clean to protect health, it's clean to protect health and then on top of it without harming the environment. And we talk about the environment, really we think about it in two ways. 
you know, the small environment in terms of the indoor and making sure there's a helpful experience for everyone who's in that building that supports the learning environment for all of our kids. And then at a broader perspective, the outdoor environment and making sure that we are creating um, programs and processes that help ensure that we have a healthy, clean environment for our future. And why? Why do we care about green cleaning? Now, we, we tend to put our, you know, five points and maybe not in this, any particular order or we could mix it up based on your given priorities, but where we like to start with is green cleaning is about making sure that kids are healthy and ready to learn. It's about keeping kids in the classroom, making sure that they are showing up every day and that when they are there, they're not having, you know, problems and issues with the indoor environment. We want to be supportive of student education. Second, we're looking at protecting the health of custodial staff. You know, it, it is our custodial workers who are working day to day with these, um, with these chemicals. And when you, you know, I'm sure many on this call today or on this webinar today um, have the experience of working with custodial staff who talk about the war stories, the horror stories of, of working with toxic chemicals. And they laugh about it. But the reality is it's not a laughing matter. We want to make sure we're protecting um, we are protecting our custodial staff and making sure that they have an environment that's health safe for their health as well. Third is increasing the lifespan of our facilities. Green cleaning is not just about um, the kids. It's not just about the staff, but it's making sure that we have cleaning practices in place that are going to preserve and maintain our buildings. It's about proper investment in our buildings. And it's also about using products and using equipment that's not going to wear down finishes that is not going to encourage our, our carpets to wear out quicker, that's going to make sure that we can expand um, the lifespan of the buildings in which we work and learn. Fourth, uh, you know, preserving the environment is so key. Looking at reducing the transportation, the production, the production and the disposal um, costs of the cleaning um, uh, systems you know, onto our environment. Green cleaning plays an important role. And then at the, at the local level, green cleaning plays an important role in promoting um, and sustainability within your individual school. So it's really important for the environment. And finally, fiscal responsibility. One of the things that to me is so interesting is we talk about the leaders. When we talk about the people who we're going to hear from today and the green cleaning programs that they have, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about green cleaning without talking about the reasons why we're doing it and the reasons for all the four above that we just mentioned, but also because it's about doing things that make sense financially. Because green cleaning is not about increasing costs and having fancy um, chemicals that are expensive and have you know, interesting shaped handles and nozzles. It's about equipment, products that are effective, efficient, and they just work. And that's, so green cleaning ultimately can not just save the environment, but can help save the bottom line. Um, so a little bit about our Green Cleaning Award winners, which were announced in December with American School and University. Um, the Green Cleaning Award is a joint program of the Green, um, Green Cleaning Network, American School and University and Healthy Schools campaign. It is a program that has grown and expanded over the years, and this year we are so honored and so excited to be showing, highlighting some great schools. Um, so you can look at this list. There are case studies that are coming out onto our, web, uh, onto our website, onto our blogs, and we are trying to promote all these stories because what we want to do is make sure that we're sharing best practices. There's only so much we can do to, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to give recognition to these schools, so at the very least what we want to do is do the best that we can to tell every school that we know that this is doable, this is feasible, and we want to share with you replicable models replicable models, and here they are. Um, and then just to mention a little bit, because we've been doing our Green Cleaning Awards now for about eight years, and, and what we've seen is a lot of trends, and you're going to hear about a number of these trends today. Um, but you're seeing the top green cleaning programs, programs at the elementary school level, at the university level, at the high school level, who are investing in people because they recognize cleaning is more about the products, it's about the people and the process that they are using chemical selection, it's not just about certified anymore. It's about looking at certified chemicals and then going even beyond that, looking at MSDS sheets, making things are, making sure that we're choosing the healthiest, the safest, um, you know, the healthiest and safest products that are available. Um, it's about process and creating standardization because we need to have efficiency and effective cleaning programs and that standardization helps with both. It helps with the training, it helps with the evaluation, it helps with um, understanding you know, how to be more effective with your cleaning programs. 
communications is something that we are seeing more and more of is making sure the custodial staff shows their worth to the community uh, by having a robust communication and engagement with students, with teachers, with parents, and that, it, that the custodial programs are actually part of the community and not viewed as separate from. Evaluation, um, tracking success and showing success and documenting success. We're seeing that this is becoming more and more important, and you'll hear some of that from our speakers today. And then finally, sometimes it's more than just product selection, but it's looking at this overarching sustainability and actually going further down the supply chain and finding out, let's talk to our vendors, and let's make sure that our vendors really understand about our goals and support us um, and support our programs throughout the life cycle of the products and the equipment that we're purchasing. So we're seeing a lot of movement. So if you know of any schools, if you are at a school, we encourage you to take a look at the application. It is available at American School and University Magazine. Download it, take a look. We hope that you can uh, get your school your schools in and, um, and, and share, and we would love to highlight the next round of schools for next year. All right, with that, I would like to introduce Keith Webb. Before I introduce Keith, we're going to ask a poll question because we want to get some information from you guys. So I'm going to start with uh, my number one poll question. What do you hope for, to learn from today's webinar? You're going to have five options on the screen right now. Take a look, answer, and I will introduce Keith. Keith Webb is the Executive Director at Plant Services in the Newport News Public Schools in Newport News, Virginia. He's a graduate of Virginia Tech with the emphasis of operations, construction, and maintenance, and he assumed management of the custodial department in 2007. With the assistance of Marcella Bullock, his custodial supervisor, he undertook a significant reorganization of the department aiming to make the custodial team indispensable, and it seems like he has done just that. For Keith, receiving the grand award has validated all the changes that he has led and in the future direction that he's taking the program. So having said that, let's take a look at the poll results. In terms of what people are hoping to learn, the overwhelming response is best practices for green cleaning program. Well, for both K-12 and for university example, we've got two great best practices to share. And we're going to start that off with, uh, with Keith. So Keith, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, you can see the opening slide. These are two things that we use quite a bit in our communication plan with the uh, various you know, stakeholders in our community and in our buildings. Um, the one on the right is a representation of our academic agenda. Uh, shows up everywhere. It keeps everybody focused on why we come to work each day. Next. So today's discussion, we're going to talk about how did we get to where we are today, and the things that we went to uh, went through in order to get this grand award was we looked at uh, we did a staffing level evaluation to get ourselves right sized from a, a personnel standpoint. Um, we took the savings and worked on an equipment investment. Then we looked at the product selections, the things we were using to clean with on a daily basis. Uh, then we turned to the human factor and looked into training, evaluation, and more training. And then taking a look at the personnel involved again and building them up, then empowering them, then rewarding them. So this will be the, the, the thread that goes throughout this, this uh, webinar for my portion of it. We'll be following each of these. Next. So I'll tell you a little bit about Newport News. You can see we're about 182,000 uh, people in our city. We have almost 30,000 students, 4.4 um, million square feet. We've got, you know, a fairly aging group of buildings in that we have uh, 43 years as our average age. Um, and we have 243 custodial positions. We're the ninth largest school district in the state of Virginia. Next. So this is a slide we use as we communicate to our stakeholders and our, um, our employees. Uh, just as kind of a, you know, a nice visual on what it means to go green. We picked up some of the things that's commonly used in the industry. Next. OK. So we're going to look at staffing level evaluation. Next. This is a screenshot of the spreadsheet that we utilize to 
uh, get to our decision about what we were going to do as far as how many people. Uh, how many people is really an industry-wide moving target. It uh, depends on who you talk to and when you talk to them as to what the number might be. Um, you would think that you could just go out and say, okay, you're a K-12, here's how many you ought to have. But you can see from our little spreadsheet that we consulted several uh, several folks, and at the time we, we weren't uh, in APA, so we didn't make use of APA's uh, statistics on the thing. So we evaluated what was the most common staffing level based on how many square feet, essentially, and somewhat the condition of the buildings being considered. And then we chose, based across that, how many custodians we were going to have in each location. Um, as a result of this study, we actually cut our workforce by about 112 people. Um, we did not have to actually lay off a single person. Uh, we, we went through the program over the course of about a year, and during that year, everybody uh, either retired or found other employment opportunities, enabling us to not cut anybody's livelihood. Uh, out of that effort, we saved somewhere in the vicinity of about $450,000. And we used that savings to work towards equipping ourselves in a better way. Next. So we used our, our savings, as I said, to buy some equipment. At the time that we undertook this effort, we were still cleaning much like people in the uh, 1800s cleaned. We were using brooms and dust pans and dust mops and we call them, I call them uh, vacuums with a bag on a stick, the old royal style vacuums where it sucks it in and blows it back out again. Uh, so we started looking for what was the latest and greatest in custodial equipment. And so the list you see here is, is the decisions we made were to go to what at that point was the absolute top of the line best decisions we could have made. Backpack vacuums and the vacuum cleaners speak to the floor models uh, which are HEPA equipped. Um, we used auto scrubbers that utilized electrolyzed water technology, active ion, um, ionator bottles, which is now kind of a passe technology since it's, we're looking for other opportunities in that arena. And I believe Jody will bring us more information on that later. Um, propane burnishers, um, along with uh, different pads for scrubbing. Uh, we use the Kyvac touchless cleaning system for our restrooms. Anybody who's uh, had some experience with restroom cleaning knows it's not the best environment uh, in any circumstances, so we try to make it a little easier to clean uh, so that perhaps they get cleaned a little more frequently. Uh, we went to microfiber both in our dust mops as well as our cleaning cloths, uh, and we instituted a laundry uh, facility within our, our building where we centrally collect our dust mops and our wipes and clean them and redistribute them back. Uh, we had been using a service for dust mops and cloths, and we wound up saving money by taking it in-house. Uh, so that was another success story behind making some of these changes. Um, made sure that the entrance mats were everywhere, that somebody was coming and going on a regular basis, because as all of you know, you lose an awful lot of dirt in those mats, and it doesn't make its way into your building. Next. So you can see we also started to address uh, recycling here. We moved to paper products that were 100% recycled content. Uh, we made sure that all the cleaning chemicals that we still used aside from the uh, electrolyzed water were Green Seal certified. Um, you can see we reduced our, our chemical use by about 85%. And this particular slide is a little dated. I pulled it out of an, uh, a presentation I made to our school board. Uh, at the time, it was $40,000 savings, but that has since just essentially multiplied across the years. Um, the equivalent of an unloaded uh, labor burden of two custodians, so that's not bad. Next. So you can see our recycling program picked up. Um, in our area, it's a lot cheaper to recycle than it is to throw it away. 
So we're working towards a, a mix of 70% recycled to 30% waste. And uh, we're reducing ourselves that in about a 30% annually. So we're going we're gonna to hit that here real soon. And this 20,000 per year was based on our first reduction of 32%. Next. So part of what we do is we train. And training is real important to success of our program. Um, what you're seeing here is the slide that we use in our training program. And it talks about um, the best way to clean. And you can see it's got some question points in it that would allow for some back and forth. Uh, we decided initially that if we wanted to be successful, we needed to be consistent effective and efficient. Those were the three things that we worked on consistently. All of our actions were held up to that lens. Was it effective? Was it efficient? Was it consistent? Uh, because everybody who is in this business knows if you have 250 employees, there's 250 ways to mop a floor. And we hope to bring some consistency by showing them how to do what we want them to do the same way every time. So slides like this help us communicate to them what sort of things we want them to do and why we want them to do it. Next. So this is just another that deals with the same thing. Uh, it talks about disinfecting, cleaning, dust mopping. Um, and it's got a little SOP into it as far as you see like always use caution signs. Uh, we've got a separate book that we issue to every school location that's got uh, cleaning tips. And so if a custodian has a, is wondering about how do I clean this particular issue or item, they can go to the cleaning tips book, open it to a, a page, and it will tell them exactly how we expect that item to be done. Next. So APA has a cleaning uh, evaluation process. It has, uh, I believe, four or five levels of cleaning. One is the highest, and that's essentially hospital clean. Um, we've striven for a level two, which they call ordinary tidiness. Of our 47 schools, you can see 40 have, have attained this fairly successfully. Uh, as with any effort, it's not something you can attain and just go rest on your laurels. You have to keep working to keep it that way. And, you know, that, that 40 will sometimes go down to, you know, 35. So you have to work on those folks. And then sometimes it'll go to 45 because somebody stepped up to the plate. But it's constantly changing because people come to work every day. So you can see what sort of things it is it takes to be a level two uh, cleanliness level under the APA guidelines. Next. So part of what we do we were talking about building people up. Uh, being a custodian is not the most glamorous career field for folks to undertake. So it's really important for us to make the folks who work for us feel valued. This is a slide that we use when we meet with those. I took this out of a presentation. To talk about, you know, the worth of the employee relative to, you know, our mission. So who are the VIPs in our schools? Next. So we said they're the first one to arrive, the last one to leave. They're the go-to person for various things. They're the person that you, if you need it done, you're going to go to them. You know, as you look back on your school career, you may remember the name of some of the custodians you interacted with. Um, they're the ones that enable an awful lot within a school building to occur. And, you know, we all know that. We just don't put voice to that very frequently. So this is a communications aspect that we try to work in and keep putting it in front of people. Next. So here's the answer to that other question. Who's the VIPs? Our school custodians are our VIPs. Next. So one of the things we did is we, in, we put everybody into, I won't call them uniforms, because they're actually a notch above uniforms. Uh, these are embroidered shirts. And they're also button-down collar. They're, they're very nice shirts. I've gotten an awful lot of comments on those uh, throughout our school division. It's provided consistency of appearance. It does away with the, uh, the 
tendency of some people to sometimes come to work dressed as though they were going to the gym. And if you look better, you act better. It's just something that we've come to uh, come to learn about ourselves. So here you see my management team uh, at one of our awards ceremonies. Next. This is one of our Clean School Award winners. Uh, you can see some of our equipment there in front of, in front of it. And we have Calvin Hendricks, Charlotte Chisman, Jeffrey Cook, and Avery Boyce. They were the Clean, uh, Clean School Award winners for last year in the Early Childhood Center. They're also a three-time winner. I have here with me, who's whispering in my ear, Marcella Bullock, my, my call a friend. Next. So two years ago, we decided in an effort to get a little bit better at what we were doing, we attended a seminar put on by the Disney Institute. Um, those are the same people who bring you Disney World and Disneyland. Uh, one of their side businesses is, is management training. So a group of us went to a day-long training, and out of that grew, uh, we sent a person down to Orlando and went through the entire five-day training period where you get about 45 hours of direct contact with Disney employees and Disney trainers. So what you're seeing here is a slide where we took what we learned in Orlando and brought it back to Newport News. Next. So they say down there it's not the magic that makes it work, but the way we work that makes the magic. And we thought that was a really important aspect. So what we did is over the course of about eight to ten weeks, I don't remember exactly how many weeks it worked out, we brought our, man, our custodial leadership in and went through the process that is recommended by the Disney Institute for creating good leaders. Um, so the first thing we did was we discussed mission, because everybody ought to be working from a mission statement. So we generated an employee mission, an employee generated mission statement, which is now proudly displayed. Then we discussed about culture, because culture is the beliefs and customs and social behavior around which people operate. So we had discussion about that. Then behavioral traits. Those are the things that you do without thinking. They're instinctive, which is really what you want a good employee to do, is act instinctively. So we went through that aspect of the training. Then we decided, what is it we'd like all of our employees to be like? If you could hire the perfect employee, what would that employee look like? Well, we're looking for traits because we can teach you how to clean. We can't teach you what your mom and dad and church and other folks should have taught you before you arrived at us. So we decided we'd like you to be safe, professional, responsible, dedicated, trustworthy, respectful, accommodating, courteous, and economical. So it sounds an awful lot like the Boy Scouts uh, oath, and that's uh, kind of where we started because one of the members apparently was a Boy Scout, and he went through all 12 of those. Then, as an employer, you have expectations of your employees, and your employees have expectations of their employer. So we had discussions around expectations, and these are important things in the Disney concept. If you don't tell people what you expect of them, it's hard for you to hold them up for you know, grading, if you will, if they don't know what they're being graded on. So an important part for us in success is making sure everybody knows what our expectations are. So we expect them to have the knowledge, skills, and ability to perform their job. We expect them to treat everybody in a respectful and courteous manner. We expect them to follow our safety SOPs. We expect them to come to work ready to work and be on time. We expect them to wear proper attire and, to, and use their PPE when it's appropriate. They need to be positive. Leave all the negative junk at the gate. They need to be trustworthy. They need to be self-starters so that somebody doesn't have to hang over their shoulder constantly telling them what to do. They need to communicate. It's a really important part of the whole thing. We need to talk. And then you have to use the tools we give you in the best way that the tools can be used. Then they also told us 
accentuate the positive and underplay the negative. And in this case, the negative is going to be the do not do's. Don't crowd people up with a bunch of don't do this, don't do that, because it's the negativity that will stick with them, not the message. So we came up with some things we called non-negotiables. That's a Disney term. But it means, you know, we're not going to talk about these things. You're not going to question them. We're not going to explain them. We're going to tell you what they are. In this case, we've only got four of them. You're going to come to work dressed and ready to work and use your PPE. You're not going to be under the influence of drug and alcohol. You're going to wear, uh, you're not going to use any tobacco products. That's a school board rule. And you're not going to use earbuds and Bluetooth devices. Those are the only four don'ts we've got going. Next. So to put all that together, we impaneled an innovation committee comprised of 20 people. Next. And those 20 people, over the course of about three months, created everything I just told you about. And this is a list of, and it's comprised of maintenance people as well as custodial folks. And of that 20 people, 11 of them are custodial. Next. So an important thing when you're undertaking anything is to evaluate it from time to time. So you can see we've, we've got, we intend to create a video which is in process so that when we're soliciting new employees, we can show them this video. And it's going to be essentially an interview with a Newport News school employee. And he's going to talk about what his day is like and what it's like to have expectations and what's the impact of the non-negotiables. And so that's partly what we learned with Disney. If you can avoid hiring the wrong person on the front end, you've gone a long ways towards building a good team. So then we're going to evaluate the program. We're going to make the changes we need to. We're going to train more if we need to. Reevaluate again, more training again. Kind of like, you know, the instructions on the shampoo bottle. Wash, rinse, repeat. Next. Another thing we've done, and this falls under the recognize them and reward them, is we have a summer cleaning contest open to all schools. Um, the management team goes around and inspects the schools, and you can self-select yourself into this program. And if you win, you're given a cash bonus. That's every member of the cleaning team. Now, it's not going to break anybody's budget, but it goes an awful long way. Next. Again, we've got school cleanliness affects learning. Again, we want to keep their minds on the fact that they are not insignificant players in the effort. Um, everything they do has an impact on the outcome, and we're a school, and the outcome is graduate. Next. So these are the winners from this past year's uh, clean green excuse me, Clean School Award. This is from one of our middle schools. We have uh, Marcella Deloach, Valerie Bryant, Nakia Sweetenberg, James Nixon, Derek Moore, Andrew Burgess, Stanley Hicks, Timothy Pathea, and Ahem, Ahmed Clinton. And I'm only saying those names because we asked everybody to tune into this, and I want everybody to hear the props if they're out there. Next. This is a winning team from our high school. Again, you can see some of the cleaning tools we've got. We've got a Kyvac machine there. That's the yellow one. We've got a uh, Cyclone uh, backpack. And we've got the uh, HEPA floor back. And then we've got an auto scrubber. Uh, the folks here are from our Heritage High School. And it's Samuel Smith and Thomasina Williams and Darlene George and Linda Harris and Demetrius Battle, George Neal. Donald Page, Peggy Adams, Garvin Tillery, and Earl Mason. So part of what we wanted to say, do, I said earlier, next, is we want to breed consistency into the work effort. So we've enrolled with Cleaning Management Institute. You can find them on the web, uh, CMI. They have a very formal training program that has two basic levels, advanced and basic. So we started by running all of our uh, leaders through the program. And now every one of our lead custodians has achieved both basic and advanced. Next. So 
at the completion of that, we have an award ceremony that's attended by the superintendent, who is the woman there in the black, and I'm the guy behind her with the beard, and it's the school board chairman that is shaking the hand. And we want to talk, by doing this, you know, we're imparting, we're imparting to them that this is an important event. It's something that we can get the highest level of our school administration behind. Again, it's building them up. It's giving them a credential that they can carry with them in their career. And this is uh, Gary Alston accepting his award. Oh, John Pickett, excuse me. I just forgot. I missed it. We changed slides. So building your employees up gets them in the right mind frame to come to work and work effectively and efficiently and consistently. Next. So this is a graph. You can see these are our costs over that period of time. You see we had a slight blip at the beginning that was associated with getting the, um, the model for accumulating our data right. So once we got it right, we started on the downward trend. You can see we're averaging somewhere around a dollar 18 cents per square foot across all of our facilities. That's not a bad statistic. Next. And finally, in recognition, this is the group that was recently given the Green Cleaning Award certificate that we received. Um, this is in the school board conference room. It was in a televised uh, presentation. And these are the folks getting their awards. And we've got Helen Meacham, Marcella Bullock, uh, Alexander Hill, Darren Dunn, and Timothy Todd. And that's all I've got for today, unless somebody out there puts a question on us, in which case I'm going to probably defer to Marcella. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, well, what your presentation really highlighted was green cleaning is not just products. It's really about people and how important that is. So thank you so much. And questions we'll address at the end. But let's quickly get to Jody. Before I introduce Jody, um, let us do a second poll question. And our question for the audience is, what is the biggest barrier to starting a green cleaning program? While you all answer, I am going to introduce Jody. Jody Krauss is the Assistant Director of Housekeeping for University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Division of Housing, and the winner of the Silver Award for the 2013 Green Cleaning Award. Jody has worked at UW-Madison for 15 years and currently oversees and manages the night shift custodial crew supervisors. Also, she oversees, manages, and tracks budget for the facilities, housekeeping department, and chairs the, and directs the housekeeping, products, equipment, and testing committee. She's been involved in promoting sustainability across the UW campus for the past 10 years. So let's close the poll and see what are the perceived barriers. And those would be resistance of staff and leadership and switching to new products, two things that I know Jody has experience with and both. So Jody, please, the floor is yours. Take, a mo take, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the kind words, Mark. So let's jump right in and get started. Um, first, I'd like to share with you guys that UW-Madison actually has a very long history of supporting and encouraging the implementation of sustainable programs for all of its campus partners. Um, I happen to work for the, for the Division of Housing, which is just the resident hall facilities. Um, and dining facilities for our residents here on campus. There are other partners. For example, UW Athletics is its own department, our Wisconsin Union, our UW Health Services, and our UW Physical Plant. And so I've actually worked with colleagues from each of those um, divisions or departments as well. And here on, at UW Madison, we do actually have an Office of Sustainability here on campus. And so we actually start out with a lot of support from our community. Um, in terms of the UW-Madison community in developing and implementing programs. UW-Madison Housing has actually been a longstanding member of a Recycle Mania program, for example. That's a national um, program for recycling within dorms. Um, we have done things similar to um, Keith with we use recycled paper products, our walk-off mats, our recycled uh, materials, our furniture that we do our interior design with and within our dorms are a lot of times recycled or reused materials. And so we take a lot of pride in that and there's a lot of uh, support on this campus to start with, which made it really easy for UW Housing to actually kind of lead the way um, in what we undertook this past year, this past year and a half. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. 
Um, leading the way, what I, one of the things I want to make sure to share is that really anyone can be a leader. And here at UW-Madison, it just happened that housing decided to undertake a new project um, in terms of how we clean. And so that put us more in the leadership role because of the campus partners. We are currently the only campus partner actually using this program. But being a leader is about action, about making a change, trying something new or different, you know, taking an alternate route um, in what we do. But being a leader, there are four very important things. Obviously, we need to know what the goal is. We need to do the research. We need to keep the records. And we need to share our findings. Knowing the goal for us and what we undertook, what was, which was a transition from cleaning with chemicals to cleaning with water. What we knew to be important to us was that we wanted to provide an even healthier living environment for our residents and a healthier working environment for our staff. We obviously were conscious of the stewardship of our resources. Um, UW Housing has its own budget. Um, we are self-sustained. We do not get um, income, for example, from the rest of campus. And so we really do know that the 7,500 kids that live with us in the dorms, these kids are like our kids, and we take them very seriously. Uh, their health and safety along with that of our staff. Doing the research, knowing what the options are, learning what uh, others have done, what did they succeed in, what barriers they faced in any type of this, this type of transition that they've made. Uh, the importance of keeping records, documenting your plan and tracking your results. Go ahead to the next slide. And then sharing the findings. And so the first step for us of being a leader was the exploration, the knowing what our goal was. As I said, we have long actually been supported and have implemented different green or sustainable programs, providing a healthy environment for our residents. We do follow APA standards of cleaning. Um, we do clean all of our common areas to APA level two, and we clean all of our bathrooms to APA level one is our expectation. We do train our staff in what those expectations are. But over the years, we have gone from you know, glug glug system, which a lot of us in this business remember what that is or know what that is, to using green products wherever possible, green seal certified general purpose cleaner and glass cleaner. We actually had one of our vendors create um, an organic salt compound for us to do our bathroom cleaning on a weekly basis. Um, that would be in addition to the daily disinfecting we were doing, but being able to clean with a more natural um, organic solution in there to remove the lime buildup. And of course, aside from our residents is, is for our staff, what are we providing to them? Getting away from that glug-glug system that a lot of us have started out with, um, putting in dilution stations uh, so that there was no measuring. Um, we could try to get away from accidents, for example, or fixing too much chemical, um, more so than what we needed to clean with, because we knew that when you had more chemical than you needed, in your spray bottle that, that you actually weren't following the instructions, you're therefore not cleaning, and you're also putting yourself at risk, especially with some of those uh, higher level chemicals that some of us use. You know, we have acid bowl cleaner, and we certainly don't want accidents with that. The other thing that we really wanted to be able to do was cut down the number of chemicals that we have and eliminate the use of those that were the most concerning. So we have custodians, for example, cleaning bathrooms and they're breathing in the disinfectant, sometimes they would come back and have some respiratory issues. Um, their breathing would be short and they'd have to go to the doctor. And we want to take that out of their cleaning routine because as Mark has alluded to and, and as Keith has talked about as well, we have you know, an obligation to our staff to make sure that when we're spraying something in an enclosed space, for example, a shower, what we're spraying is something that we can tolerate, um, but something that's not, or not only that we can tolerate, but something that's not going to hurt us. Um, and so that was a very important part of our goal was making sure that we were conscious not only of our residents, but of our, our staff. Next slide. For us, breaking ground, you know, step two was actually doing the research. We looked at all the alternative methods we could use. We knew that we wanted to go with water-based cleaning. We actually we're in the middle of contacting Active Ion and having them come into um, a meeting with us to see what we could set up. Um, unfortunately, they were no longer available in our area. And so we needed to go 
to the vendors that have provided our, our chemicals and asked them what resources, if any, they could provide to us. In doing that, we had to stay within the boundaries. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have limits or boundaries that we have to, to stay within. For example, here at, at UW-Madison, we have contract limitations. Um, and pretty much everybody has budget limitations, no matter where you're at. Um, I don't know that anybody's budget is unlimited. So you definitely need to be aware of the cost. And uh, if, if you're run by state contracts, which we are in terms of who we buy from, it's really important to honor those as well. Um, we then created our plan, what our schedule was going to be, what it was going to cost us, how we were going to get our staff support, and how we were going to be able to prove that water-based cleaning either was better or not better than our chemical cleaning. Um, next slide. So in creating our plan, the first big step for us, of course, was our schedule. We knew that we, knew we wanted to test. Um, we wanted to basically be able to test the water-based system. And we decided to go with Lotus Pro um, from Tursano. And we wanted to test that against the chemicals that we were using at that time. And so we developed our test plan. We decided you know, which surfaces we were going to test. We started out with bathrooms, because those are our most critical, since we cleaned Apple One. And you have multiple residents using the bathrooms on each floor, along with the public bathrooms. Um, common spaces came after bathrooms, but we wanted to start with the bathrooms first, and so we decided which, which surfaces we were going to test, from sinks to toilets to shower partitions to counters um, to walls to the door handles. We wanted to make sure we got all of those touch points. We decided who we were going to test with. We were very specific. We actually picked um, several of our staff to test behind, and then how we were going to test we decided that we would, and this it was I that did this. So I went into the bathroom with the custodian and tested surfaces before they actually cleaned. And then I tested surfaces after they cleaned with the chemical. I did that again in another bathroom. I would test the surface before they cleaned. And I would test the surface after they cleaned with Lotus Pro, which is our water-based system. Next slide. Next slide. How we did that was what we purchased was we purchased handheld Lotus Pro units, which are just bottles on chargers. Uh, we purchased four of them to start. And in conjunction with that, we purchased what's called an ATP tester, which is shown on the right. The ATP tester actually uses swabs to swab the surface. And then you put the swab into the tester. And you actually, it gives you a digital readout. Um, of a number, and basically that number is the soil that is left on the surface. And so we tested surfaces, as I said, before and after we cleaned and compared those numbers. We tested before and after we cleaned with chemical and before and after we cleaned with water. And as you can see from this slide as well, basically kind of the startup cost for us, this was really actually a very inexpensive thing for us to do. The handheld testers cost us $274. The ATP tester, um, I'm sorry, the handheld units cost us $274. The tester cost us $1,500. And then, of course, the swabs um, were separate for the tester. But our Office of Sustainability, which I mentioned earlier, because there is a great support on this campus of clean, uh, green cleaning and sustainable programs, they actually helped us purchase those items. And so, we were able to get those handheld units and the ATP tester and the initial swabs for actually no cost to our department, but rather UW-Madison Office of Sustainability picked up those costs for us. Next slide. In order to gain staff support, what we did was we actually went and met with our staff. We walked them through why we were testing this cleaning system, how we were going to test, and really ultimately the importance of the feedback that they gave us. We also then, when we tested, we shared, we made sure, share, sure, excuse me, that we shared every test result with them. And as you can see on the right, it gives you kind of a face view of that ATP tester. So the number that's in green, that 30, that is actually the number that comes up after you've tested the surface or before you've tested the surface. And we could show the staff what those numbers were before and after they cleaned with chemical, and then before and after they cleaned with Lotus Pro. Next slide. 
This slide actually just shows you some of our results, but um, it isn't so much the results as much as documenting that plan. Um, this is actually step four of creating our plan, having the proof, having the results. And it's also our third step in basically how to be a leader, making sure that you do have those records, that you're documenting the results. Um, the ATP meter and software um, is something that we can access on our computers. We can store this long term. Um, there, is no, there is no cost for that. There's also visual results that we have taken, so before and after photos that we've used to show um, our staff as well as our colleagues in other campus departments what our results are. Um, and so the, the photo on the right or the example on the right is actually the testing results before and after we cleaned with our current chemicals at that time, which were uh, disinfectant um, A456 from Ecolab in, in our bathroom. And so, for example, if you look at the numbers, that top number, um, it's the 247 Smith 3100 um, toilet seat. That's the location. If you look to the far right, you'll see where it says fail. It says 5975. That's what the soil content was on the toilet seat before we cleaned. And if you go down to that top, where it's highlighted, where it says fail 597, that's what the soil content read after we cleaned with chemical. We still failed, although the number dropped quite a bit. So that's what we were trying to visually show our staff what their results were. Uh, next slide. The uh, next slide also shows um, just some of the testing results that we had. And this actually shows our testing results before and after Lotus Pro. Um, again. You know, we were. This just helped us be able to show the custodians. Okay, here were your numbers before you cleaned. Those are that are not highlighted were before she cleaned, and then the ones that are highlighted are after she cleaned. It just gave me a chance to be able to verbally talk with and visually show this custodian what her numbers were um, and how she was doing. And she had a number of passes with water, and that became very important to us. Next slide, because what we found was that we were actually getting some of the results were the same as, if not better, with water than they were with chemicals. And so we continued to test. And we continued to share this information. Because getting support, obviously, is, is huge. You need to have the support not only of your staff, of your community, um, but being able to document that. And so our final step in kind of being a leader, what I thought was the final step, is being really being able to share what you did, what you found. Whether it's a positive or a negative. So if it worked, great. And if it didn't work, that's OK. Um, getting that support and being able to share those results with the folks that you got the support from. For example, the Office of Sustainability helping us with the initial cost uh, of our ATP meter and our Lotus Pro units. They were very interested to see the results we got. And as a result, for us, housing kind of became <laughs> the guinea pig, so to speak, on campus. But we've also then become the leader in using this technology because we've done all of the testing. We have all of the results. Talking with colleagues, um, our other departments, for example, here in, in the residence halls would be dining. Um, we also have university apartments. And so we have started cleaning some of our apartments using Lotus Pro. Talking with partners, for example, athletics, um, or talking with the Wisconsin unions and sharing them, uh, sharing with them our results. And then, of course, submitting our results for recognition. Next slide, which we did with um, in winning the, the Green Clean um, Award. And so sometimes it's important to remember that, you know, keeping a big picture view, it's not always a quick timeline when you're making this type of transition. Um, but really for us, this was very quick. We were looking for ways to improve or change our cleaning program to go from cleaning with Green Seal certified to cleaning with no chemicals uh, in about 2011. And in 2012, we did our first testing behind four of our custodians. We have roughly 65 custodians that work um, in housing that are full-time custodians that doesn't include our students. Um, also in 2012, then we went ahead and, and purchased those handheld units and the ATP tester, and then started sharing that information. In 2013, we had such good results during 2012 that we actually purchased our first six wall mount units, which you see a photo of on the right. 
in early March of 2013, and we continued to test behind our custodians. In October of 2013, we purchased another 22 Walmart units, and we have those installed in all of our residence halls at this point. Um, and so we are very happy that we've been able to eliminate um, the use of disinfectant, uh, general purpose cleaner, and window cleaner in those areas. Also in November 2013, I actually did a presentation for the Vice Chancellor here at the UW and his direct report, um, which was very um, exciting for me to be able to share that information and the results and answer their questions. Um, so exciting that uh, one of our campus partners, the Office of Sustainability um, and University Health Services, was very excited to hear about this. University Health Services is our clinics here for our residents. And so they were very excited to see what we were doing. And it was um, really nice to be able to talk with them because we actually clean one of their satellite offices. And so they now know, and they were very supportive, that we were actually cleaning their offices with water, and it's considered hospital grade. So um, they were extremely happy with that. Um, and then again, being able to be the silver recipient of the Green Cleaning Award in 2013 was a big, um, big recognition for us and showed a lot of support. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that on campus. In 2014, being able to do this webinar, and I'll be doing another one, um, or I anticipate doing another one in August to get into more, much more detail of Lotus Pro um, from Tursano. And then in October of this upcoming year, um, I will, or in October of this year, I will be presenting at one of the APA conferences in Missouri. So some of the things that we learned, next slide. Lotus Pro um, water-based cleaning actually did take the place of our big three chemicals, our disinfectant, our glass cleaner, and our general purpose cleaner. We know that Lotus Pro um, has not been effective on grease-based stains. So for example, in our food service areas, somebody drops their tray of food, it had french fries on it or a burger, <laughs> it's not pulling the grease out of that carpet. Um, and we are at times still having to use um, a chemical when, to break up that grease. Um, the ATP tester is not usable on fabric, so we could not test before and after we cleaned with Lotus Pro on our carpets or upholstery. We have to rely on visuals, um, such as the dirty water in the tank and actually the look of the carpet or the chairs, for example, the upholstered items after. One thing we also learned was sometimes how hard it can be to change the mindset of long-term employees, myself being one of them. If you had told me you know, a few years ago that you could clean with water the same as you could clean with chemical, I would not have believed you. Um, but seeing it for myself and letting our long-term employees see it for themselves, that has really changed for us quite a bit, that a lot of my staff that have been here for 10, 15, 20 years are really impressed with how well this is working. The other thing I think we learned out of this transition and process is that ATP, using an ATP tester in conjunction with the water-based cleaning was absolutely a must. There was no way that we were going to be able to have proof or document our changes in our transition without that tester. And so I actually owe a huge thank you to our vendor for suggesting that because we would not potentially have thought of that. Um, when we actually switch to water-based cleaning with Lotus Pro. Next slide. As you can see, we actually did experience um, a very large saving uh, in the cost of our chemicals in 2012 and 13, spending $47,000 on the big three that I mentioned, and in 2013-14, spending just $18,000 on those same chemicals because we were replacing things with Lotus Pro. During 2013 and 14, we've spent 5,500 on the Lotus Pro stabilizers, which is the one piece that you do need to replace. Um, but in one year, we saved roughly $23,000 um, on our chemicals. And that isn't taking into account our custodians, like the number of sick days, because they're no longer having respiratory issues. That doesn't take into account the transportation costs that we're saving. Uh, we have many fewer trucks on campus right now delivering chemicals because we are no longer buying them. Um, and things of that nature are not actually measured in this. So I just wanted to make sure to point that out. Last but not least, uh, next slide. In leading change, biggest things that we learned um, being looked at now as kind of leaders in this area is take the risk. Sometimes 
we shy away from it, but take the risk. It is worth it. Um, when you care enough to improve the environment that these kids live in or improve the environment that our custodial staff work in every day, it is worth taking the risk. And sometimes that is truly how you actually outshine your competition or, uh, or the person next to you and become a leader. Communication is absolutely critical. Communicating your plan, your feedback, your goals, listening, excuse me, listening to the feedback that you get, communicating especially with your staff. We have gotten a lot of really wonderful comments from the staff and from the students who live here, how happy they are that there's no more chemical smell on their floors after we clean. And then, of course, sharing the results. Whether it be a success or a failure, you can learn a lot from a failure. Um, lessons learned, we've all been through this. And so sharing those results with others and really being able to, to highlight what you've done is important, no matter how it turned out in the end. So, and then there is my information. If anyone has any further questions for me, they can always get in touch with me if they'd like to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey. That was, that was fascinating. Uh, I will say we want to have time for questions, and there are a bunch of questions, but we're already over our hour. So I'm going to ask a quick question and if you, to see if people have a little more time and would like to stick around. So we're going to post a quick poll and, and let us know, do you have a few moments um, to stick around? We'll, we'll have about eight more seconds to let people answer. Blah, blah, ding, da, 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 da. And people are basically saying, it looks like, um, yeah, so it looks like, okay, so the majority of people say they have got around 10 minutes. So let's just get right into Q&A. Um, I'll say really quickly, again, if you know a school, Look, uh, if you know a school is interested, apply for the Green Cleaning Award. We hope you'll be able to be there. Uh, I'm sorry, was Keith, did you say something? I'm here. Okay, great. So then, Alice, why don't you take away and go through the questions? Great. Thank you so much to both of our speakers and everybody that's still on. Um, please feel free to send in your questions. Um, so first question, in addition to health, shiny floors are important to us. <laughs> is that possible with green cleaning products? Uh, so Keith and Jody, is that something that you would be able to comment on in terms of floor care with green cleaning products? Uh, this is Marcella Bulletin for Nupa News. Um, yes, it is possible. It's just a matter of basically what we do is we use a restore to keep our floors as clean as possible. and in order to keep them shiny so they don't go flat? Because that's what we do in Newport News. And then yeah, here at UW Madison. I'll also add to that, there's some really fa phenomenal new products out there that allow you to keep a, um, a shiny floor without having to reapply and, and um, do a, you know, a stripping process. So there are a lot of really interesting process, um, new products and processes out there that actually do allow you to have the upkeep that we're used to without having all the chemicals. So I would say for UW-Madison, yes, we've also experienced the same thing where our goal is of obviously to have shiny floors. It does make it look better. Um, and we actually don't apply anything to our floors. We have had our floors um, diamond polished. And so the upkeep for us is actually just cleaning them with the auto scrubber um, using Lotus Pro. Um, there, is no uh, there is no wax applied to our floors. And um, they do stay shiny. So there are other options out there. Great. Thank you so much. Next question. Jody and Keith, you both have, both have fantastic programs. Can you tell me what your plans are for the next year to, make, to continue to improve them? So I would, I guess, I'm sorry, so this is Jody. I guess I would take that answer first. In the next year, um, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be installing additional units um, into our, our dorms, there is one residence hall that does not have the Lotus Pro installed yet, um, but our plans are to continue to move forward with that so that we do have that transition everywhere. Um, in addition to that, once we can get the Lotus Pro um, completely installed in that last building, we are going to continue to look at eliminating more of the chemicals that are on our list. So for example, we are still using strippers um, on a lot of our floors, and we're looking to actually eliminate that process as well to cut down the number of chemicals that we do have. And Great. in Newport News, we're probably going to, continue, going to take a look at the Lotus Pro, because uh, as I said, we're, we're looking for some alternate to the ionator. And uh, we're going to be expanding the training into our 
workforce a little deeper as opposed to just at the leadership level. We've just started our classes for the uh, rank and file at this point in time. Great, thank you. And Keith, next question is for you. Um, can you clarify how you were using the active ion and what types of cleaning you were doing with it? And then you answered the follow-up to that is, what are your plans now that the active ion is no longer available? Well, we were pretty much using it on the same surfaces that Jody was talking about using it uh, with her product. Um, and before they went out of business, we actually bought a fairly large supply of their um, pieces of equipment. So the equipment still works just fine, um, and we're still in the process of trying to find a replacement for it. So every school has still got multiple handheld units of the ionators. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question, Keith, is for you as well. Can you speak a little bit about how you're engaging the broader K-12 community, so students and staff, in your program? Well, for, for example, this, uh, the invitation to this webinar went out uh, to every school. Um, we, we also uh, engage all the school-based staff in our various training programs. We've also been able to work with our curriculum and instruction folks, and we now have some sustainability and environmental education going on as directly applied to the curriculum. We started in the elementary schools, and uh, it came as a result of looking at a commercial program and our curriculum and instruction folks going, well, if that's all there is to it, we can do that. And so they've been working on embedding uh, green practices and sustainability into the curriculum. That's great, thank you. Um, and question for Jody. Jody, can you speak about the type of training that you provided around using the new water-based technology? Sure. Um, the training that myself and one of my colleagues received was actually from um, from our vendor. Um, it was a hands-on cleaning in order to be able to use the handheld units. Um, in addition to the ATP tester and the company uh, Neogen that does the ATP tester actually trained us also. Um, on how to use that, that uh, the ATP tester itself. In terms of our staff, um, that was actually kind of an interesting training because it happened on site. Um, the handheld units are very small, very compact, and so it was me just taking each of them a handheld unit, um, showing them how it works. You simply fill it with cold water, you turn it on, and it charges the water in that bottle. It takes about two minutes. And then being able to use that water um, for about the next 15 to 20 minutes while it holds its charge was all the time that we needed to clean the bathroom. Um, in terms of when we fully went to wall mount units, um, it's actually simply just a one-page uh, instruction sheet on how to use it. And it is very simple in terms of training. It's actually turn on the cold water and push a button. And so it was really easy to handle, and our student employees um, absolutely just loved it because they just thought this was like the neatest thing and quickest, easiest tool they'd ever seen. So it's actually gone very well. Um, and training has been consistently done through all of our units. So everyone is using it at this time. I'd, I'd like to add a little bit to that. I'm sure the Ozonator project is similar to the Ionator. There's a dwell time that has to be adhered to just like with most cleaning products. I mean, you just can't just spray this water and wipe it off. Uh, both in the ozone treated as well as the electronic treated. There's there's a dwell time consideration. That's true, and the dwell time consideration for Lotus Pro is 30 to 60 seconds, um, no matter what the surface is, as opposed to or in comparison to the dwell time of 10 minutes for your standard disinfectant. Um, and there is actually, you do actually receive a chart that will show you what the dwell time is for each type of surface. It would be a little different if we were cleaning mold, which we haven't tested on yet. But in our bathroom surfaces, it is 30 to 60 seconds on every surface. Great. Thank you. Um, and sorry, Jody, quick clarification question somebody wanted to know. Are you using the Series 1 or Series 2 Lotus Pro, and why? I didn't know there were two series. <laughs> My goodness, I'd actually have to look at that one. So <laughs> well, actually, while you're looking for that, Keith, quick question for you. 
are you using the active ion for only cleaning or also for sanitizing? Actually, we're using it for both. We use it for both, sanitizing and cleaning. cleaning. Great. And oh, Jody, yeah. were you able to locate what series you're using? So I, have the, so I have the manual here in front of me, and it actually does not say it's a Series 1 or a Series 2. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's I mean, we will look into that and send that information to the speaker. Um, and then we're going to, or sorry, to the, to the person who asked. And one final question that just came in for Jody, which I think is an interesting one. Jody, what can you do when a university has a small budget and wants to stay with water-based technology? Do you have thoughts on, on how somebody could create a program that's water-based when they don't have a ton of funding available? Um, I do think the first, the first most important step that you can take is actually to talk with your vendors or your suppliers and see um, what they can do for you, what are the costs going to be, um, and really then can you make the argument over time, for example, um, is, I, and I, so I'm not sure how this university is set up, but for us, for example, the Office of Sustainability, we were able to make an argument to them that over time, even if there were some upfront costs, that over time we would be able to see a savings in several different areas. Um, and as a result of being able to see those savings, it was more, they were a little more amicable to looking at it in long term um, as opposed to short term. Um, and there are, I'm just trying to think, I don't know, a lot of universities usually have kind of some funds. Um, there are some grant programs out there that universities can look into to get funding. And sometimes, believe it or not, because I've had this offer on my campus, there are companies that would love for us to test their product and will provide that product to us as long as we will allow them, we would share our results with them and then allow them to basically use us as kind of a, a poster child, if you will. So that might be some other ways. Great. I think that's, um, that's wonderful points to make as well. Um, so great. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and for everybody who was able to stay on for the webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, just as a reminder, we have four more webinars coming up this summer, and we will send out information about how to register for those. So thank you again. Thank you to Jody and Keith for sharing your wonderful programs. Congratulations on your Green Cleaning Awards. And we look forward um, to staying in touch with everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.